Well, uh, when I was with you last, which was a couple of Sundays ago, we uh, got started on a uh, message series, and we called it, What Does God Require of You? Say that. What does God require of me? And understand that God requires something of us as believers. He requires something of us as Christians. And God is not going to change his mind what he requires of us. We know that we are in this world, amen? But how many understand that we're not of it? Which means that we are not to conform, we are not to embrace the culture of this world system. And whether you realize it or not, you know, there are Christians uh, who seem to blend more with the direction that the world is going rather than the direction that God is taking his kingdom. Whether you realize it or not, that is not the direction <laughs> that God desires believers to go. Believers are to go into the world, right? And they are to minister to the world and they are to take those who are in darkness, those who are outside of the kingdom of God, those who are in trouble, and bring them out. But we're not to conform and embrace the culture of the world. Got one amen? I'm sure we'll get a few more when I start dancing on this platform. <laughs> Look. Jesus is truth. I said, Jesus is truth. And one thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is he's going to always communicate truth. Now, y'all know, know the, uh, the, the, the verse of scripture there in the, the gospel of John. You shall know what? The truth. And what does the truth do? It makes you free. Right? So you will never hear anything other than the truth come out of the Lord Jesus Christ's mouth. Right? How many love the truth in the room tonight? So we are not to uh, conform and, and embrace the culture of this world. As, as good as some of it may look, it's still the culture of the world. And we are to uh, be the ones who are the light. We're the light. Do you know that the world is darkness? Do you also know that those who are in the world of darkness don't realize that they're in darkness? So what the light has to do, the light has to do is they have, the light, that's us, we have to go into those places where the enemy uh, believed that he has people in such a position and he has such control over them and he has such an influence over them that they would never get out of it. But I want you to know that the devil is defeated. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Amen. He will never be anything other than that. His whole reason for existing is that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He doesn't have any other reason for his existence. No other reason. Wow. But we also know there's a, there's a place for him. How many Christians we have in the room tonight? <laughs> we, we're supposed to rejoice knowing that there's a place for the devil. <laughs> right? So, so, so the, the book of Romans uh, 12 says that do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, why, Lord? So that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are God people. <laughs> we are the children of the Most High. 
I, I, I like uh, the uh, Message Bible of uh, Romans 12. The Message Bible says this. It says, don't become so well adjusted to the culture around you that you fit into it without even thinking. Isn't that something? Do you know that we have some unthinking Christians? Huh? Absolutely. Don't become so well adjusted that you fit into it and you don't even think about it. Don't give it any thought whatsoever and just blend right in. Now, in the, in the evening service, <laughs> I just have to tell you, I know that I may get a little radical and I know that I may be a little firm, but it's the evening service, so you know that right after this service, you can go and get some sleep. Right? Don't become so well adjusted to this world that you fit into it without even thinking. And the Message Bible goes on to say, it, it, it says, but fix your attention on God. Fix your attention on God and your change from the inside out. I love that. You know that God deals with the heart of an individual? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Corinthians says no flesh shall glory in the presence of God because God is always dealing with your spirit he's always dealing with your heart always you are a spirit being of the father of spirits that's what he deals with the heart amen so we, we as uh, believers, we as a church, we as the family of God, look, we have the, the same spiritual father. We're in the same spiritual family, right? right? So therefore, our household is about spiritual things. The father's spiritual things. Can y'all say amen? amen? So then, if, if, if that is true, and it is, then it's obvious that, you know, we can't uh, be looking like the rest of the world. <laughs> so, 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 y'all know in a, in a natural family, in a natural family, right, uh, each of the members of that family has a responsibility in that family uh, to uh, uh, ensure unity in that family and to maintain unity in that family, each member. You say, well, well what about uh, the, the, the little ones, the children? Well, the parents are to teach them how to ensure unity in the family. And generally, that's what parents do, right? You know, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when your kids, they get in, in a fight or an argument or a disagreement, you don't just let them, uh, you know, tear one another apart, right? No. No, you don't. You're there to break it up, and you're there to communicate to them, no, you love your brother. If you want to fight, make sure that you're fighting uh, the person who may disagree with your brother. Right? Oh, I was raised in the South. That's the way we grew up. I was in a lot of fights now. <laughs> Look, most of them was with my brothers and sisters. That was 10 of us, you know. <laughs> So look, you, got, you, <laughs> you learn how to survive when there are 10 people in the family, you know, and, and just one table. <laughs> so, but no, listen, this is the deal. Now, now uh, when we uh, are growing up, my family, you know, when we are in a spat one with another, you know, there may be some things that take place. But we're talking about, you know, we are to ensure unity and maintain unity in that family unit, right? But you let someone from the outside come in and start making a mess. Well, I remember one time. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to go there, right? But the point is, the point is that, you know, you don't let anybody mess with your, your siblings. Right. Your, and oh, and don't even go 
close to mama. You don't even put mama my name in your mouth. <laughs> if you're from outside, right? So, so we are here as a family, and we are a unit. And, 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 and we know that if we as the family of God, if we are going to maintain a spirit of unity in the bonds of peace, if we are going to be the light of the world, if we are going to be the example, if we are going to hold forth the word of life in this crooked and perverse generation, we must understand that there are some things that God requires of us. Of us. So, so we, we began that series, right? And we, uh, we uh, uh, went there to Micah uh, chapter 6 and uh, also Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, 10, right? So let's just turn to that text, the uh, scripture again. Mike, Micah chapter 6. And I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. It says in verse 6, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yielding calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people, that would be us. We're the people of God, right? And he goes on to say, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what is required of you. To do what is right, or, or just, we could say just. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, now, now look to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And we're going to continue to read from the uh, New Living Translation. In verse 12 of Deuteronomy 10, it reads, And now, Israel, okay, so we're going we're gonna to personalize this, right? He says, and now, Israel. So you insert your name there. So let's read it that way. And now, Minister Darnell, what does the Lord, your God, require of you? So God doesn't, he doesn't uh, throw a question out there and not provide an answer. Here's his answer. What does he require of Minister Darnell? He requires only that you fear or reverence the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today. And look what he says at the end of that verse. This is the New Living Translation. He says, for your own good for your own good so 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 we took these two passages there in Micah 6 and Deuteronomy 10 and we compiled these uh, eight requirements of the Lord right and, and 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 remember in both of those passages it says that what the Lord requires of us is for our own good, our own personal benefit, our own personal welfare. Now, if someone tells you that something is good for you, then generally, you're not going to hesitate to uh, partake of it, right? If it's good for you, right? Well, maybe I should say it this way. If someone told you that something is bad for you, you're going to try and avoid it, correct? Absolutely. So when God says something is good for us, then we want it. Bring it on, Lord. Give it to me, Lord. Oh, because you are good. <laughs> now, when we used to say that in, church, in the church, um, we say, the Lord is good. What do we used to say? All the time. All the time. Well, he doesn't change. Just because he said that there are things that are required of us, all of a sudden, it, it, does he change now? No, it's good for us. I said it's good for us. You know, I've, I've, uh, uh, I'm going to list those, those eight uh, uh, requirements, right? 
But, but I've heard uh, Christians say, well, you know, what is, what, is, what is my purpose in the kingdom of God? Or, or, or they might say, uh, you know, we just uh, quoted there uh, from uh, Romans 12 too, right? And at the end of that, 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 um, that verse, there in Romans 12 too, it says uh, that we may prove what is what? The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, right? Correct? Yes. Well, listen. These requirements are the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And if you put yourself in these, you'll never disappoint the Lord. So let's list them out. These are eight specific requirements. Number one, we are to do what is right or just. Now, how many Christians would disagree with that? Okay, good. No hands. Requirement number two, we are to love mercy. Requirement number three, we are to walk humbly with our God. Requirement number four, we are to fear or reverence the Lord. Number five, we are to live in a way that pleases the Lord. Number six, we are to love the Lord with all our heart and soul. Number seven, we are to serve the Lord with all our heart and soul. And requirement number eight, we are to obey the Lord's commands and decrees. Or we could say it this way, we are to always obey the word of God. Right? So these are, are eight godly character traits that God says that we are to carry out as believers in this earth. And then he says that these are good for us, our personal benefit, our personal welfare. It's good for us. But also notice that he says that this is what I require of you. Well, if God says that this is what I require of you, this is not just some suggestion he's throwing out there. This is not just something that is optional. No, God says he required this of us. So these are instructions. Actually, these are commands from the Lord Jesus Christ. These eight commands, right? So, so if God is saying that this is required of us to carry out, then we are to walk in the light of this truth. Can y'all say amen? amen. So we, uh, uh, when we were with you last time, we uh, talked about requirement number one. Requirement number one, right? Do what is right or do what is just. So we're going to pick up with requirement Number two, requirement number two is what? To love mercy. You guys have that, uh, Sean? Oh, they did? Oh, okay, thank you. To love mercy. Everybody say mercy. 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 Oh, I love mercy. No, I am quite serious, Minister Linda. I love mercy. Do you know that mercy... Mercy is plural, or merciful, is found in the Bible 361 times. Now, the Hebrew word for, for mercy, according to Strong's Concordance, is pronounced he said. That's H-E-S-E-D. And it means unfailing love. It means <laughs> devotion. It means uh, kindness. Everybody say, be kind. be kind. In, in um, Ephesians 4.32, he says, he says uh, and, and forgive, right? And show tender mercies and kindness. I'm paraphrasing. But I, I, I found it interesting that God has to tell Christians to be kind. Hmm. Apparently, it implies that Christians can be unkind. Now, now, now I understand. It's just the flesh. 
but it's not you, it's not me. It's not what's on the inside. Do you know, uh, 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 the, the Bible says in 2 Peter uh, 1, 4, it says that we are partakers of his divine nature. There's no rudeness in God. Yeah, that's what I said, Minister Ford. <sighs> that's no, look. Look, that's our nature as Christians, as believers, to be kind. Uh, It's unfailing love. We're to be devoted to this. Mercy. Mercy. And so the Greek word for for the word mercy, uh, uh, according to Strong's, is uh, pronounced El Ehos. That's E L E H O S. El Ehos, right? And that means um, uh, active human or active divine compassion. Active divine compassion. Say divine com- compassion. Active divine <laughs> compassion. Oh, my Jesus. So, I, I, I said I love mercy. I love mercy um, because speaking of Mary Magdalene, who was delivered from uh, several spirits, unclean spirits, right? And you, you, you notice how Mary Magdalene uh, got in the Bible. <laughs> and you notice how many times that she's mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, Gospels? Do you know what Mary Magdalene did before she was delivered from those unclean spirits? And the Bible says that, that uh, she loved much. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. She loved much. In other words, to whom much is given. Much is required. But I'm going to tell you this. We have all been delivered from darkness. We all, listen, listen, we all have been delivered out of the power of darkness. Now, we have to think about these things. And when I say we have to think about them, now, I simply mean that if you think about what darkness consists of and you think about the ultimate end of remaining in that darkness and think about what that consists of, we all have much to be thankful for. Therefore, therefore, there is much that is required of us. So sometimes, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we want to uh, write out a, a list uh, of, uh, well, you know, uh, they did this, this, and this, and this, and this, uh, you know, when they were in the world. Man, I could sit down, I could sit down uh, on these steps, I think, and I can list out things that I did this, 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 and this. But when I came out of this, 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 and this, I was appreciative. Because I realized that was the mercy of God. I realized that I could have remained in this, this, and this, and I could have remained in that darkness, and I could have remained... And I have to tell you, darkness is darkness. And if you never come out of it, it's the same darkness. And the same ultimate end. So listing this, this, and this 
And, you know, we really should never go there. It's like the man who went in the temple uh, to pray, right? He looks over at uh, someone of a lesser status in his mind. And he says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like him. And God says, it didn't actually say this in the Bible. Darnell says, <laughs> oh, yes, you are like him. In fact, you're worse. Because you feel that you can criticize. You feel that you can judge another. You feel that you can throw mud and not show kindness and not show mercy. You feel that you can do that. Because you happen to have a title of a priest. <laughs> well, every saint in this room is a priest. And so, we know, I, turn to uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and um, verse, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2 verse 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4. I'm going to read this from the New King James Version. It says, but God, everybody say, but God, but God. who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, have been saved. Have you been saved? And raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to read this from the Amplified Classic Edition, right? Same passage, verse 4. But God, so rich, is he in mercy because of, listen to this, because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. Now, I'm going to read this snake's statement here, right? And this next statement is expressing that this God that we serve, this father of ours, that he is so full of mercy, he is so full of love, it says the great and wonderful and intense love of God. It says that, look, he was not satisfied. This love, this love does, does not get satisfied. It says that from that point, that point, God has put us in heavenly places. <laughs> and I love this. He has seated us together with him. It says given us joint seating with Christ. <laughs> that love is intense. That mercy seated us together. Look, you have joint seating with the Lord of Lords. You have joint seating with the King of Kings. You have joint seating. Look, you're not sitting off, you know, to the end, on the end of the, uh, the, the bench. You are right there with Christ. And why? Because of the mercy of God, because of this intense love, because of this wonderful love, because of this great love. Amen. That's where you are. It's the mercy of God. You are no longer where you were nor are you any longer who you were. This love is intense. It says that he had to do something with this love. <laughs> he had to satisfy this love. Therefore, he did not leave us in that, pla that place of dead in our trespasses. Therefore, he did not leave us in that place of sin. Therefore, he did not leave us in that place of darkness. Therefore, he did not leave us in that place of on our way to hell. 
He had to satisfy this love. And not only did he have to, he did. So listen, this, this uh, uh, divine compassion, right? This divine compassion is active. It's active. In other words, it's a compassion that is so deep, there is so much depth to it, it's a compassion that just don't say something or just don't feel something. It has to do something. That's why he lifted, lifted us out of that place. That compassion had to do something. <laughs> Everybody say, do something. My wife was telling me this afternoon, right, that on her way home, she saw, she noticed uh, this lady elderly lady on the street and she had a, a small child with her, five, six years old. And my wife, she uh, uh, picked them up. Now my wife, she drives a, a two-seat car, right? But it's three of them. But because of the compassion that she had toward them, she picked them both up, right? She took them to get them, uh, uh, feed them and, uh, you know, she gave them all of the information about about the church, my point here is that uh, she didn't just look over and do you, can you imagine how many people must have drove by and walked by these people? The mercy of God on the inside of us, this divine active compassion on the inside of us should never allow us should never allow us to just drive by this dying world. It doesn't just say something. It doesn't just feel something. Active, divine compassion does something. And that's what God did. He did something. He did not leave us there. Oh, he could have. Because a, a, a holy and righteous God in sin has absolutely nothing in common. And that's what we were. We were sinful people. So he could have left us there. But this great and wonderful an intense love had to be satisfied. Therefore, he rescued us.